Hello, everyone who is joining us. I am absolutely delighted to be able to uh, welcome you to this inaugural event in the How to Think Together series. And I could not imagine two better people to be joining me in this particular session. Um, Sonali and Phil, from whom you'll, you'll hear more shortly, are two among the people I have met during my research leave stay in May last year now, so May 2023. Um, in the US, where I was predominantly based um, at the Hannah Arendt Center for Politics and Humanities at Bard College. Um, this series was conceived uh, during this research, research leave or research stay, um, in part because um, one part of my own work is concerned with Hannah Arendt's work on thinking, and part of my work is concerned with political plurality. Now, as we know, Hannah Arendt was among the people who sought or conceived thinking as predominantly a solitary activity. So as she referred to it, uh, the silent dialogue of oneself with oneself. But then on the other hand, Hannah Arendt was also centrally concerned with questions of how can we actually live and think and work together and how can we organize together uh, politically. So she was actually quite critical of the idea that uh, we should remain isolated or that we should remain focused on ourselves. And famously, um, I'm just going to read this quote before we, we launch into the discussion. So um, she mentioned or she referred to uh, the work of thought as among others um, or among some other professions that we'll be also addressing today as dominated or um, at the risk of slipping into solitude. So she wrote, outstanding among the existential modes of truth telling are the solitude of the philosopher, the isolation of the scientist and the artist, the impartiality of the historian and the judge. These modes of being alone differ in many respects, but they have in common that as long as any one of them lasts, no political commitment, no adherence to a cause is possible. From this perspective, we remain unaware of the actual content of political life, of the joy and the gratification that arise out of being in company with her peers, out of acting together and appearing in public, out of inserting ourselves into the world by word and deed, thus acquiring and sustaining our personal identity and beginning something entirely new. So tonight I'm joined by Sonali Chakravarti, whose work is in particular on how juries deliberate and think together, so transcending, in a manner of speaking, this boundary between thinking for oneself, so thinking in sol solitude and acting together, and Phil Lindsay, who works on citizen juries and citizen assemblies, or citizen assemblies, not citizen juries, who is thus also very centrally concerned with the question of how we can at the same time act together, but also think together. So um, my opening question to both Sonali and Phil is uh, to, for them to tell us a bit more about the kind of work they do and the kind of thinking together that they have encountered um, in their own work. So Sonali, I'll pass it on to you first, if you don't mind. Thanks, Yana. I'm very happy to be here and happy to be in conversation with you and Philip. And um, I feel like last time I saw you, we were taking a walk together and thinking together, which I feel like is a, a, an archetypal way of thinking together um, uh, uh, between friends and colleagues. And so I'm happy to do um, a, a version of that with you all um, here today. Um, so as as was mentioned, um, I'm a political theorist and my work is on, um, on juries. I, I study um, how people learn how to become jurors how the trial teaches jurors um, how to think um, and uh, you know, helps them feel more confident in their thinking, and also how the process of being a juror uh, changes the way a citizen thinks about their responsibilities. Um, so my, my book is you know Radical Enfranchisement in the Jury Room and Public Life, and I titled it this because I really think of um, the uh, jury service as the better part of enfranchisement. We often think that voting is the key thing, um, but it's voting and jury service, and why jury service is um, is so compelling for, for me is because you really have to think. You really have to be with other people, be with strangers, um, uh, suspend other things in your life uh, to engage in this um, uh, very important political question. 
And it's not coincidental that what juries decide is whether there's, you know, and I'm most interested in criminal cases. So what these juries decide is whether there should be punishment or not. And um, and that is like where we feel the power of the state to take away our liberties. And before that can happen, um, we are given the, the, you know, the right to a jury trial um, to have a group of our peers um, ideally uh, decide whether that punishment is warranted. Um, and uh, and so the, the kind of uh, you know, bringing together of all of this labor and attention, um, uh, it, it, you know, is a, is a fitting way to decide this very important question of whether there, there should be punishment, initially some type of violence, you know, in a way committed by the state against a person can only happen after um, a kind of true and committed um, uh, deliberation. Um, uh, you know, I, I also think the juries um, transcend Arendt's categories of of work and action. You know, Arendt, uh, you know, oftentimes thinks of the law and thinks of um, formalized um, political mechanisms like voting as you know as these you know fairly mundane forms of work. Right? They are more um, uh, they are building something, but they are not creating something new, and they're they're they they oftentimes do not participate in new beginnings. Um, but Arendt herself had an encounter with a jury that um, that changed the way she thought about this and. And um, and she said that the jury is is the, the last bastion of true um, uh, political participation um, uh, because of what you know what it um, asks of citizens what they are capable of doing. I think also of the new community that is formed inside the uh, the jury room. Um, in this past year, there was this kind of silly show on an Amazon called Jury Duty, and it was a, basically a reality show where one where um, there were all actors except one person thought he was really being a juror in a civil uh, case. And um, it was only in the last episode that they told him that this was all, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, a set. But you, since you've done, done such a good job being a juror and you were so nice to the rest of us, we're giving you $100,000, uh, you know, for your time. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I'll be showing it in my in my seminar this uh, semester to say what, what about this actually gets at the heart of, the, of, of what it is to be a juror and what about it is Hollywood, you know, uh, doing its thing. But but um, uh, but I think why the show was a hit actually, and um, what it said that was true about um, about jury duty is that. Um, it is one of the only spaces where we truly have to get along with and think with strangers. And um, and while that um, is, uh, you know, can force people to think of excuses not to uh, do jury service, um, when people actually do it, on average, they are happy with the experience. They leave with a great with greater confidence in their fellow citizens and within the legal institution. And they are and oftentimes they feel invigorated by the fact that they met all these people from di different parts of life the you know life in the city that they wouldn't have met otherwise and they did something important together and um and so um you know by, by working on this topic many people always come up to me and say i was a juror once and i think it's because it's a it's an experience that really sticks with people because of how they felt during it the dignity that that it confers on jurors and also um what they take with them afterwards so i'll stop there even if they do not get a hundred thousand dollars, <laughs> even if they don't get a hundred thousand dollars, they oftentimes are happy they did it. Some of them have regret um, about if they've you know convicted, and you know now looking back, they worry that they you know um, that that wasn't the right um, a right outcome. But uh, but in, it, but it just it, it, it is this peak experience for for many people in their lives to have uh, to have um, served as a juror. Great, thank you ever so much, Phil. What about Assemblies. Yeah, well, I'll start with this idea of peak experience because I think it led me to where I am working on, on citizen assemblies at the Hunt Rent Center. Um, so, well, first I'll say a little bit about what we're doing with the Democracy Innovation Hub at the Hunt Rent Center, and that's that's what I focus on, our hub. Um, and it started about uh, six or seven years ago with another thinker, David Von Raybrook, uh, a few, uh, Roger Berkowitz, our director, and a few students at at Bard uh, read this book and were essentially uh, had their had their uh, thinking about democracy expanded when they when they found out that you know in in ancient Greece only 100 of the 7,000 or so public servants were were actually elected using elections and that the rest were chosen through some form of sortition or random selection um, and that the and that the jury as as Sonali mentioned is the sort of uh, last bastion of this form of democracy. And so since then, reading that book, which is called uh, Against Elections, uh, David Von Raybrook, which is a great introduction to the, the history of citizens' assemblies and lottery in politics, 
um, essentially at the Hunter Rent Center, we started exploring uh, different, different ways in which we might bring this uh, type of thinking to Bard's campus. And through that desire to bring that, uh, uh, bring the, this, this alternative history of democracy around random selection to the campus, we, we started, my role has really been reaching out to a lot of the organizations that have been doing these citizens assemblies or citizens juries for decades. And there are many of those organizations, including some of the pioneering ones in the United States. Uh, there's an organization called Center for New Democratic Processes, which is, used to be called the Jefferson Center. There's the uh, Stanford's Deliberative Democracy Lab and James Fishkin's work there on deliberative polling. Um, so essentially what we've been trying to do at the, at the, at the Democracy Innovation Hub is just shine more light on this existing work, learn from, from uh, folks who have been studying this and also running these experiment, experiments all around the world um, and try to bring them uh, more to New York and then try to create communities of practice with other um, centers of, of, of education, not just uh, colleges, but also high schools. Um, but when Sanan mentioned this, this idea of peak experience, my, my I think what led me to, to this work is when I was in high school, very distant, you know, mostly not excited about being in school, not having, uh, I was a student who I was much more excited about that kind of out of that the less uh, planned, more, the, the moments where I was, I was having uh, uh, more expansive or kind of out of the mundane experience, experiences. And my most inspiring experience, experience in high school was with a group called the Philadelphia Student Union. And there was a, a an intentional um, organizing tactic by this by this uh, by this social movement that was essentially to mix students from across the school district together. Um, so we met. I, I as my as a chapter leader in at my high school met students from all across the city that were at, were experiencing high school. Though we are all in the Philadelphia public school system, we were experiencing high school in many different ways. I mean, Central High School, where I went, was the one of the only high schools that still had a functioning library. And so essentially our, our meetings with the Philadelphia Student Union were, um, the, the, what we were fighting for was equal, equal funding for education um, in, you know, in public schools and one of the last surviving other spaces other than the juries where people actually have to learn how to live together. Um, and being a part of this group and meeting kids from parts of the city that I would never have uh, met um, was transformational and totally expanded my sense of what the city was, my identity, how I related to Philadelphia. And so I've been kind of trying to replicate that sort of peak experience my whole life in terms of the expansiveness of what it felt to me to be a part of something larger than myself but also something that was deliberately trying to create spaces of uh, diverse people interacting with each other and trying to find solutions to basically the question of the commons and how we live together. So when I, when I started working at the Hanar Rent Center, I was just thrilled I, and I still feel really, um, really grateful to get the chance to start to think about, it's sort of the meta thinking about if we believe that these types of institutions um, like the jury provide a peak experience in terms of democratic life, how can we expand that to other parts of, of our society? And right now, the Democracy Innovation Hub, we're focusing on catalyzing experiments locally with citizens' assemblies and trying to help public servants or uh, community leaders or decision makers, the funding, ha ha have, it, have it come together and, and, and um, basically you know, stand up these, what we see as schools for democracy. That's brilliant. And I think you're, you're highlighting something really important, which is the socialization sort of effect or role of these kinds of things and how important it is to actually have an experience regardless of how early or late of thinking together or participating in collectives. I was wondering if I could ask both of you just sort of relatively briefly, I guess, or maybe not so briefly to summarize for people who may not be familiar with either uh, citizen assemblies or juries, basically what happens? So Sonali, what happens in jury duty? What kind of thinking together happens? And then we'll move on to Phil to give us the sort of a, sh a short, uh, or again, for those people who are necessarily or not necessarily familiar with uh, what takes place in either to kind of give us a, a further taster of what it actually looks and feels like. So Sonali, do you want to go first? 
Sure. And um, I'll, I'll be talking about the American uh, legal system and there are variations, you know, state by state, but um, but I'll give a, a brief overview. Um, so most states um, uh, create the jury lists from uh, through what are called motor voter lists, which means either people who have uh, who have their driver's licenses in that state or who have registered to vote in the state. Um, to be a juror, um, you have to be 18 years old and you have to be a citizen of the United States. And then what, once you appear for jury duty, you have to be comfortable with language as the um, uh, uh, language of communication in the in the courtroom. So if you meet those uh, three criteria, and even some people who don't meet those get 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 a card in the mail um, that says you have you you are expected to show up for jury duty at, at this time. This is where you should park. Um, sometimes uh, uh, you, uh, you um, people are given um, uh, compensation for um, uh, for their time, um, and so it'll say something about that on the card. Um, and it said you might be subject to a fine if you don't show up uh, for, uh, for jury. So there is a little bit of a stick uh, um, uh, quality there, um, and if you have, if you cannot do it, you, there is a hotline to call to say, you know, I'm expecting a baby the week before, I, you know, I'm out of the country, whatever it is, um, and it, your date gets postponed um, uh, to uh, to another time. And then on that day, you show up in the courtroom and you fill out usually um, a, um, a, a questionnaire, a kind of a generic you know, uh, questionnaire usually about um, uh, uh, about whether you can commit, you do, do, uh, do the responsibilities uh, expected of you. Um, also, what your connections are to law enforcement, um, uh, you know, um, and uh, um, and to lawyers and judges. Um, and they'll say who the, you know, um, like who the legal officers are in the case, if you know any of them, you have to disclose that um, uh, at that time. Uh, sometimes there might be, if it's, you know, depending on what kind of case it is, there might be a question like, have you ever been the victim of, um, you know, of a mugging or, you know, something like, and and if, if, if you, uh, you answer yes, um, either that might be the basis for automatic dismissal because it's too closely connected to the case, or, and this is what I write about in my work, um, you might be questioned by the judge about, like, what happened to you? You said this, you know, there was an incident, um, uh, and, what you know, uh, do, do you think that would affect your ability to um, be impartial in this um, in this case? And, um, and so then in this um, interesting alchemy of both what the juror says, but the judge, judges, uh, and also the judge's assessment of um, a juror, juror's ability ability to be fair, um, uh, uh, the judge makes a decision whether a juror is qualified or not for um, uh, for the case. Um, and then once um, once uh, you know a, a pool of people are are deemed to be qualified, then there's this very interesting thing that happens. In the American system um, is that both sides are allowed to use a certain number of what are called peremptory strikes to just remove the jurors that they don't think would be favorable to them. You don't need to give a reason. So you you know so the one side will just say we want number seven, number 12, number 20 off, you know, and then the other side says we, we want number three numbers, you know, whatever. And, um, and this is to, uh, you know, to allow, uh, you know, both sides to feel like they have a fair jury, not just the, the what the judge thinks of as qualified jurors, but also people um, uh, basically get rid of the people that they think would be um, uh, at least favorable to their side. But one thing that I look at in my work is how peremptory strikes have often been used uh, to pick off um, black jurors in particular, leaving um, uh, juries that are, um, uh, you know, uh, predominantly white, even when the defendant is black. Um, and and, uh, and even though there is a procedure to challenge this, because you're not allowed to use race as the reason that you pick off a juror, it has, you know, um, uh, it's very difficult to remedy this, uh, this problem because the, you know, when a lawyer is asked, why did you remove, you know, ask for number 11 to be um, off the jury pool? They'll say, oh, well, you know, they said that their brother worked with the, you know, in this company and that company might come up and they won't say because of, uh, uh, because of the juror's race. Um, so I, along with, you know, a number of other scholars right now, we're looking at how how do we get around this problem where both obvious racism comes into play, but also unconscious bias that lawyers um, aren't even admitting to themselves that the real reason that that, that they're removing um, uh, black jurors and jurors of color or, you know, is, is because of their race. Um, uh, so just um, so once the the jury is, is selected, uh, they uh, they basically are in the kind of the individual individual phase of the trial because you're not supposed to talk with the other jurors about the case uh, until the end. So even though you're going, you know, it might take three weeks. Um, every day you're supposed to you, you know you go you go home. It's very rare that you go to a hotel, even though that TV show made it seem like uh, you know okay, jurors spend lots of time in, in a hotel. You go home and you're not supposed to talk to your family. You're not supposed to talk to your friends. You're not supposed to post on social 
media. But um, the thing that's probably most difficult is that you have lunch with the other jurors at the courtroom, but you're not supposed to talk with them about what, what you've just heard or what your ideas are or anything like that. You're supposed to keep it um, inside until the end of the trial where the judge gives the juror their charge, what, you know, what, what the questions are that they are to consider. Um, uh, and oftentimes this is a, quite a long uh, discussion between the judge and jury. Um, then the then the jury goes into a room by themselves. There's no court officer in the room with them. There's a, like a bailiff that stands outside if they need anything. Um, but you have the 12 jurors and the two alternates usually um, in a room. Um, if you've seen the movie 12 Angry Men, it dramatizes this uh, this moment. Um, and uh, and then it starts that it just, uh, you know, and, and there's no one, no one tells jurors, first you should do this and then you should do that. You know, um, you, you, it just kind of emerges organically. Like, should we take the charges in turn? Should we take a straw poll of, of uh, how, how we feel? Should we go through each witness? You know, the um, kind of usually a, um, a system is kind of uh, uh, discussed and then um, and then uh, the jurors start talking about the evidence and uh, how they interpret it. And then ultimately they have to come up, you know, fill out a form uh, which says what the verdict is. And, um, and you know, and they are told that, you know, to, uh, to convict a, a defendant, um, the state must have proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt. And um, one of the things that jurors always want to know is, can you explain to us what reasonable doubt is? Um, but the whole system is set for jurors to figure it out for themselves what that means. And judges cannot, the more judges say about that, the more that can, can cause problems on the appeal later. So you're supposed to say, you know, some judges say what a reasonable might, person might think, uh, you know, it, 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 it gives reason to doubt. Some judges won't even say that. So, um, so jurors really have to do this meta discussion of what is reasonableness, what is doubt, you know, do we, uh, has the burden of proof been met? Um, uh, but in my work, I'm particularly interested in also in what goes into not guilty verdicts, because um, on, on one level, the not guilty verdict is just a verdict that has not reached that level of evidence. But um, in my work, I also talk about the power of juries to nullify, which is to find a defendant not guilty apart from the evidence. Like you might, you, uh, jurors have the power always of issuing a not guilty verdict, and no one is going to go around and say, you know, why did you, why did you do this? Um, and so they can do it because they think the law itself is under. Just. Um, they can do it because they think the prosecution um, uh, was corrupt in, the, uh, you know, in this case. They can do it if they think they, if they have particular compassion for that defendant. Um, but you can see how this it can it can is a controversial uh, power that a jury has um, because the compassion they feel for one defendant uh, might be they, they might you know might be based on um, partiality in, in a certain way. Um, but uh, uh, but I am really interested um, uh, in this power of nullification. Um, large Largely because it is a secret power that usually judges do not tell jurors that they have this power. So you have to have known about it beforehand or what the Supreme Court has said, if you spontaneously feel like you know, the, the jury spontaneously comes to the not guilty verdict, like they just can't, in, in, you know, as a group, give a, a guilty verdict. That's the that's the power of nullification, you know. Um, so. Uh, so, yeah, it, it, uh, to me, it's a fascinating in, in, instance of the power of the people like has to be kept secret from themselves because it is too dangerous to think what they might do if they really knew it. I was going to say, I couldn't imagine a, a better sentence, uh, <laughs> sort of the power of the people, as, as overture to, to Philip's, uh, Philip's sort of um, part, the <laughs> power of, people, of the people has to be kept secret to themselves. Phil, what does it look like when it comes to citizen assemblies? I mean, I'm noticing some of the similarities, but also differences in the sense of Sonali, one of the things you've said that to me were actually quite interesting, and I think I did not know before, although I have a feeling we may have spoken about it is that in effect in jury duty you do get kind of both ends of the spectrum right you're thinking to yourself during the time that you're not actually allowed to to um converse about uh, about the trial with other jurors but then obviously the liberation happens at the end and you know whatever your individual thought process is does not really matter as long as or until you have uh, reached a verdict. Um, Phil, I have a feeling that's a bit different when it comes to citizen assemblies, right? Yeah, with citizens assemblies, it, it's definitely different. It, I think there's a similarity there with deliberative polling, which is it would be interesting to explore. Um, there's a spectrum of these experiments around taking randomly selected groups. You know, this is the essential idea of a citizen assembly is how do you create a uh, 
mini public, a representative mini public, that are also often called deliberative mini publics. How do you create a smaller group of the larger population that is uh, equitably, let's see, uh, constituted so that the, you know, that is a, a representative group of the larger population? And then how do you put them, put them through uh, a, a process that allows them to take on the responsibility of making judgments about public policy together? And then how do you integrate those public policy recommendations into an existing political uh, um, system, which often doesn't have a legal way of uh, deciding on how to incorporate those, those policy recommendations? So the difference with the jury Prime, firstly, to start off with, is that this is not part of our constitution. You know, this was Hannah Arendt, uh, at least our interpretation of Hannah Arendt at the center is that these assemblies would have been the kind of thing she would have liked to have seen constituted in the beginning of uh, the American experience. But there wasn't, while we have town halls and, and there's, there's a, a, you know, uh, there's the jury, we don't have something that uh, like a citizen's assembly part of a constitution. So that means these don't have legal weight necessarily, especially in the US. Uh, in certain, in other places where there is a, um, a, a constitutional requirement for pu public participation, that fits in differently. But essentially there's three stages to any citizen's assembly. There's the random selection of, of people, which usually takes uh, as, it's it's not too different from what Sonali described in terms of people getting a letter in the mail. Though, depending on uh, the creativity of the conveners, you can have door knocking, you can have announcements, um, you can have, uh, you know, you can make the lottery a, a, a public event, which actually, um, especially our, our, uh, our colleagues uh, in uh, South America have, have kind of uh, especially focused on this and the, the Center for Deli the Deliberative Democracy Lab at Stanford talks about how, how important it is to make the lottery event a very uh, public media, uh, you know, engaging event in which everyone, the, the, the main purpose of random selection with, um, with when it comes to public policy recommendations, unlike the sort of criminal justice um, making decision about punishment, is that everyone has the expectation of, or, or the, the possibility of being selected. And there's, a, and there's an understanding that this process is happening and that will kind of guarantee more impact in terms of the actual process. So there's this random selection that usually happens in multiple stages in which there's, let's say 10,000 random uh, um, addresses that are selected. In the US, it can be done through uh, postal service addresses. Although again, you, get, you gotta get creative on, on how this is done and how to make it most representative. Then there's a follow-up stratification of the, the folks who, who have responded, because there's going to be, unlike with the jury, where there is a fine or because it's part of the constitution, there's no, um, the folks who will respond are going to be self-selecting. Um, and, and so then there's a stratification, and these are political questions, again, of uh, uh, ethnicity, uh, age, gender, occupation, income. Um, you know, you, you can get some of this from the census. You can you can estimate some of this based on uh, school population, et cetera. But essentially, you're you're depending on the locality and access to data and people's likelihood of responding to an invitation. You're stratifying, and then there's a lot a, a lottery um, of the based on demographic data, right? So you're trying to match to certain demographic data. Usually, that's things like educational attainment, age, um, gender. Um, you know, you need at least a few markers to, to get, uh, and, and geography, I should say, especially in Stanford's experience, geography is really important. Um, so there's the random selection, then there's a process of um, learning uh, around the policy issue. So let's say if the question is um, around, uh, should taxes be raised to pay for a new uh, new, new, new highway? Should taxes be raised to pay for X, Y, and Z? Should we uh, open a new school? Should we do, you know, do, what do we do with the, the budget surplus? Does it go towards the uh, redesigning the wastewater treatment plant or reinvesting in public schools, right? Like these assemblies have taken place uh, all around the world, hundreds of exper experiments. They, on all types of policy processes, and I would say they've been learning experiments, uh, experiences. Um, Around a hundred of them have been around the world have been focused on climate 
what to do around climate policy, both mitigation and adaptation. Um, and then many of the high level ones, especially in Ireland that changed Ireland's constitution were about uh, broader cultural questions on abortion and um, equal marriage. So in the, the second stage, first stage random selection, second stage learning process around the policy issue. So again, the, the intention or the driving question is how do you create a, a, a learn, a, a, an ideal learning environment uh, with a, this mini public of randomly selected folks? And usually that means bringing in a diverse group of perspectives, having them interact with the assembly itself. These assemblies are anywhere from uh, 30 to 150. Uh, the larger experiments have been around a uh, thousand folks. Um, there's a people want to look it up. There's a U.S. specific uh, deliberative polling exercise called America in One Room that was very well documented by Stanford. Um, again, that's on the spectrum of deliberative polling, but I, I lump them all together in as these experiments that have, that have these random selection learning experience and then policy recommendations. Um, and then so that third uh, the third stage after the learning and deliberation is uh, generating policy recommendations. Um, and in some cases, in some of the more, uh, the new experiments, generating action steps for the assembly itself or an affiliate network of organizations that are connected to the assembly, right? So um, that's complicating it a little bit, but the basically random selection, learning experience, deliberation, formulation of policy recommendations, um, I don't know, I think I'm gonna keep it there to not get too complicated, but essentially like there's a spectrum of these experiments and some of them are more um, towards a more polling exercise between policy where there's a, it is more like a jury in some sense of deciding uh, is this, how do I feel about this policy? Do I approve of it? And then there's also more problem solving sort of generative experiments, which are more along the lines of generating new ideas, generating new, uh, solutions that might not have been thought of. I have a question for Philip uh, about um, the the binding quality of the decisions that might come out of citizen assemblies, right? So to me, one of the biggest differences and is about the, the, what the jury's decision is binding. And that's why we can even have nullification in the first place. Judges don't like it, but like if a jury comes out with a not guilty, like they can't do anything about it, right? Um, and I always say that the right to a jury trial is like kind of snuck into the constitution, kind of like a Trojan horse, you know, like we we would never get a jury now um, if you were, were to, to pass a legislation about it. Like just let 12 people decide and whatever they say, we we abide by that decision, right? It, it gives so much power um, uh, to the jury. So I'm curious what you think, uh, um, yeah, how to balance uh, the finality of what a citizen assembly suggests uh, versus, you know, other interests that need to be taken into account. Yeah, it's it, usually that is also the first, if you talk to a lot of people, I mean, depending on who you're speaking to, that's also also a first question is, is like, oh, we're now going to let people decide around, you know, tax policy and you're gonna take random group of people. The reality is just like you said, because especially in the US, these are so outside of the constitution that the idea that one of these experiments would have any sort of binding power is, is it's impossible at this moment. There's, there's the New York City Council, if they, if they wrote an, uh, that they could not legally say an assembly could come up with binding policy recommendations because that would be, um, um, losing the word here, that would be essentially like uh, uh, getting rid of their own legal jurisdiction. They can't do that legally. So in the U.S. especially, these are, are always non-binding. However, there's a political interaction, uh, like for instance, in, um, well, I'll start with one example at like a, a municipal level. Um, in Poland, there was a mayor who agreed uh, before a citizen's assembly was convened on um, flood protection and flood resilience plans, he came out and said, you know, if, if over 75, 80% of the recommendations, if, if an assembly agrees and votes on a specific recommendation, I promise as mayor to implement those recommendations. So there's a political, there's a sort of a political, um, there, there are political promises that can be made. And right. And then, and then the only question is, is there, uh, is that promise any hefty, is, is there weight behind that? Or can it, you know, does, does the person uh, possibly lose a, an election if they go back on those promises, right? Um, right now, uh, 
in the citizens assembly world, none of these, none of these uh, decisions are binding. There are processes that are connected to budgets in which participatory budgeting is combined with deliberation. And then the question is about money. And so a lot of the, 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 the money is essentially uh, designated by the, the, the deliberative body that's making the decisions. Paris's uh, permanent citizens assembly is connected to, the, to choosing the theme of the participatory budgeting and, and the participatory budgeting in, in Paris is quite a substantial amount of the, the annual budget. So there are some spaces like Paris, uh, Belgium, um, East, uh, the German speaking region of Belgium in which there are more permanent uh, bodies that have sort of oversight powers over the city council. They can, they can publish a report and say, we think these things need to change. And if you city council are, or at the uh, East Belgian level, um, if you disagree with us, you, you have to, you legally have to respond to us within uh, six months and tell us why. Again, still the decisions themselves are not binding, um, but there is a political power counterweight that's created uh, in, which, in which recommendations have to be taken seriously. I was just going to interrupt and say, we have a, <laughs> a galloping set of questions already. <laughs> so before, uh, before we move on to these, I just wanted to make sure that we go through a couple of other other things. And I mean, I think this clearly, first of all, shows that there is so much to be said about um, or more to be learned about forms of collective deliberation for, for everyone. And also, it's clearly a topic of, of interest. I'm hoping that we can um, eventually turn this uh, series of conversations into something like a publication or an edited volume. So, so hopefully people will, will be able to, to learn more about it without um, being restricted in terms, of, in terms of time. But before we move on to questions, I was going to ask both of you to comment um, briefly, if you don't mind, um, on what happens when collectives do not agree. So how do collectives resolve disagreement? What are, what are your thoughts, experiences, observations from respectively juries and assemblies? Snali, do you want to go first? Uh, you're muted. So yeah, so I'll start. Um, you know, the uh, a jury's decision has to be unanimous. So either they're guilty, all 12 have to say guilty, or not guilty, all 12 have to say not guilty. If there is some, if they, if you can't get there, um, usually what happens is um, uh, you know, the four person of the jury will tell the judge, we, you know, we've been doing this for two days. Um, we, we, you know, four of, four of us want one thing, the other eight want another. We don't know what to do. And um, I've written about, um, you know, there are kind of two things that a judge can do. Or I've, I've thought about two things that a judge can do at that time. One is um, uh, what in some states is called the dynamite charge, which is the judge can go in there and say, you know, the, uh, um, you know, we need to come to a decision. Um, there's nobody better than you to to get us there. Um, if you are in the minority, you should not held give up a deeply held belief. If you're in the majority, you, you should listen to the perspective of the minority. Um, uh, you know, please try your best to reach a verdict. And um, and so that's option A. Option B is the judge just says, um, you know, please try one more time. And then if you can't come up with it, uh, you know, uh, we, we'll deal with that later. And I've written about how I think actually option B is the better option. That um, that even though uh, option A is just uh, you know um, uh, repeats the interest of the court to reaching a verdict, um, I I think that actually a hung verdict is sometimes the right verdict. That there really are decisions that can't be uh, can't be solved in in the room. And if there has been a lot of time. Has, has gone by um uh that we should respect that and what we know from uh from studies on this is with hung juries it's usually not one person that's a holdout um uh it is uh, oftentimes it's two or three people um who are refusing to go along um uh for good reason right um and so uh so i think that um uh, you know uh, uh, disagreement is, like is, is a sign of actual thinking um if it happens too much it will stop the whole process um but uh, uh but i think um uh you know uh, judges and courts it should, you know, somebody should become more comfortable with disagreement, um, and uh, uh, you know, and and they tell us a lot about um, uh, about what the issues that were being discussed uh, at, at the jury. That's great, Phil. What about? Sandy? Yeah, th this might be one of the places to explore the the key difference, maybe, and that is that assemblies are, and I didn't mention this at all. 
again, if you're trying to create a, a ideal learning environment for folks to come to mostly consensus based, um, not, um, not unanimous, they don't have to be unanimous, almost never in these assembly uh, processes are is unanimous. It's, 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 it's just not the case that the policy recommendations have to be unanimously uh, decided upon. Um, they are, if you're trying to create an ideal learning environment, they, the, a key part of these processes is facilitation. Um, and having facilitation, especially small group facilitation, within if you have a, a group of 150 people deliberating, usually, especially in Ireland, which is again, this has become an institutionalized practice at the national level of Ireland. They essentially have a, an agency that runs these now um, on, on many different topics. And um, it all, all takes place in one large plenary room. And then you have smaller uh, tables in which people are seated and which they often rotate. And at those smaller groups, you have a facilitator making sure that no one person is leading the group. Stanford actually uses an AI to keep time and make sure that everyone it has the exact same amount of time. And that if someone hasn't spoken, it encourages them to speak up. But you know, there's different techniques for this, but um, facilitation of the small group to ensure that the group is not, that no one person is dominating within any small groups and that folks who tend to be quieter or tend to have less of an outspoken personality are speaking up is crucial. Um, and ideally, again, this is not all those facilitators are gonna be great in this. There's, a, there's an art, uh, which I think the entire assembly process is actually learning, which is how to encourage healthy disagreement within the assembly in order to, to you know, learn deeper and figure out kind of the, the, the core places of, of consensus around value. I will say that usually these assembly processes start with a values-based conversation, right? So if the community is deliberating about a new highway or taxes or how to deal with climate change, you know, the last thing you wanna do is just have these randomly selected group of diversely ideological folks dive into a question, like a very specific pragmatic question. That, that ideally you're, you're breaking ice and you're getting to know each other and humanizing each other. So I think, um, but then once it comes to deliberating, I think that the, the core part in the assemblies is having really good facilitation um, to encourage that healthy disagreement. And those are things that we have not trained for in our society. Like few of us have been taught how to do healthy, transparent disagreement or or let alone facilitate that in another group. It's facilitation skills and those active listening and encouraging uh, empathy in a, in a group have not been taught. And so a lot, that's also what we're trying to do at the, the rent centers actually develop training courses. We're looking at um, Davidson College actually has a, a few day training course on, on, on facilitation skills for these deliberative forums, for instance. And we're trying to learn from that and create one ourselves. Um, but in terms of just purely technical on like how they disagree, usually these assemblies produce some sort of, it's not called a, well, it, it's essentially like a majority uh, policy recommendation, then there's sometimes a dissenting policy recommendation. Uh, those dynamics are also, um, can be created by the assembly. If a small group of folks disagrees with the way things have been facilitated, they can recommend, they can come up with their own report, right? So there's, um, there's a, uh, it's essentially, this is a, a new type of institution. It's, it's inspired by ancient Greek democracy, but there's an innovative aspect to this in terms of how do you create an ideal um, consensus-based policy uh, tool. That's brilliant. And I was just going to say, I mean, clearly there are many similarities, but also lots of differences. But before we move on to questions, and I really, really hate to cut this conversation short because clearly there's, uh, there's for both of you so much more to add. So I hope we can continue this at some point. Uh, but before we do, I'm just going to come back quickly to you, Phil, and then to Sonali um, to ask, what is the most important thing about the nature of thinking that you have learned from observing citizen assemblies and then juries respectively one sentence each for me it has to be the mixing so i think it's the interaction with people that you would never uh ideas and and perspectives that you you wouldn't have encountered through your career through the trajectory that your society like your your class, your your geography, your your ideology, and, and I would say the 
um, the freedom that comes with some of the constraints of having to be impartial, um, that it feels like it, you, you can't bring your whole self in the ways to the jury room, but yet you can, but somehow the constraints are a type of freedom. That's brilliant. And I think it really, it really gives us a lot to think about <laughs> collectively um, in hopefully a less, uh, less time constrained manner. But um, on that note, because I know we have a lot of questions, um, I'll pass on to Urja, who can hopefully sort through some of them or perhaps group them in a way that <laughs> lets, you, uh, lets you address, if not all, then at least the majority, hopefully a diverse majority. Yeah, no, I think also since the questions have come in and the conversation's been going on, some of them have already been answered, so that's quite good. I'll start with Isha's question that came quite early on, uh, but she asks, can you talk about some of the concerns that empirical studies have raised against deliberation? Uh, so she says there have been, um, these have been raised by anti-democracy theorists like Jason Brennan, uh, Cass Sunstein, Mandelberg. And they talk about how it increases polarization and amplifies um, biases. So no I feel, idea. Philip, maybe more your, your your lane. Well, you know, I, first of all, I, I preface this with with I am by no means an expert uh, in uh, democracy theory or uh, deliberative democracy. I instead say I have a strong instinct that if we can create ideal or closer to ideal, uh, not perfect, but closer to ideal uh, learning environments in which people have healthy disagreements, then those are, I, those are great kind of schools for building the muscles that we need to, for democracy. Not that, the, the, that any single process will be, uh, will be perfect by any means. I think it would depend on, um, for instance, it makes me think of the, the way that deliberative polling, this is one of the differences I wanted to, to point out between deliberative polling and citizens assemblies, for instance, and that they could be combined, but deliberative polling, the way that they do it at, at Stanford is by when folks come into the process, um, thinking alone about the policies and taking a poll about how they feel about the policies. They then go through the deliberation and then they also um, continue that they, they once again think alone and fill out a poll about the policy. So rather than, I'm, I'm gonna guess that Isha's, your, um, your comment, uh, or I would say this, the, the, there's ways to guard against these things. So I think it's a question of um, the way these processes are designed and also like what our expectations are for them. I think like, I think if there's a poorly designed process, it could absolutely amplify biases. I go back to just like personally lived embodied experience of when have I, when have I been forced to really question my own, the ways I think about things. And like, it, 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 it it's, there's a confrontation that happens there. So I think initially there can be an increasing polarization, but then if there's a forced reckoning with kind of the experience you had of, of having to deal with someone else's opinion, then you, you know, you're forced to reckon with that. So I think, I don't know if I'm answering the question, Michelle, but Sonali, if you have other thoughts. No, I would I would just um, uh, reiterate about how we can we can deal with this that right that that you know I've I've joked that I think jurors should wear robes um, as well as judges because it shows that they are playing a different role in society right so you're not coming and like spouting off your ideas that you have in another sphere like you are you let's say you are really critical of the prison system like you should keep that in your mind that should inform the way you deliberate but that you know the, the first thing either you know the, that's not the way you open you know the discussion in the deliberation room um, so. Um, knowing that we can code switch as citizens in a way that's authentic and, uh, um, yeah, uh, you know, um, is, is not compromising us, but actually allowing us to be in different spaces, I think um, is uh, an empowering thing. And um, and that that can also work against just replicating our, you know, uh, all the pathologies that we see in so many other spheres. Um, okay, that was really helpful. Um, I'll ask another question that came from Leon. Um, Leon was wondering if you two could comment on the veto a little bit, specifically about how it may be problematic since it's not anonymous and it can create a rift between the veto or and the group. 
Yeah, I mean, I think thinking about a recalcitrant juror, right, that is a really difficult situation, right? Uh, like a juror that refuses to deliberate, a juror that, you know, like basically holds, you know, racist, uh, you know, ideas that doesn't really, you know, does, is not willing to let them go. Um, I mean, and so I think, you know, these are, you know, really big problems. And um, oftentimes, you know, juror misconduct can be reported, you know, to the court and, and the jurors are removed and the alternate is um, allowed in. And there was even a Supreme Court case, um, uh, Pena Rodriguez versus Colorado, where where um, a two juror said that another juror made racist comments um, about the um, about the defendant, um, and uh, and the, the court went all the way. To the Supreme uh, case went to the Supreme Court, and the court and the Supreme Court said, while we don't, um, uh, you know, impeach the jury, meaning we don't override what the jury has come up with, and in this case, they came up with a conviction um, because um, uh, racial prejudice has been such a scourge on our legal system. Uh, we can't allow that to happen in our jury room, so we are going to uh, remand the case. And you have to start from the uh, from the beginning. And um, uh, you, the, the, this was not a fair jury because uh, these comments were made and seemed to have influenced the guilty verdict. Um, so, um, so yeah. So I think um, uh, you know the worst aspects of our democracy are there in the jury room and in citizens' assemblies, and um, we need a variety of tools uh, to deal with them. And I think sometimes it leads to having to start from scratch you know, uh, um, because the process was tainted. I would just take the, the moment to um, bring in a comment that, that Sue made in the chat about uh, um, in Ireland, the way these assemblies are connected to referendums. And so as the actual, uh, I mean, this is a little bit different than the veto power, but essentially, uh, and it goes back to the question of, of um, uh, whether these, yeah, basically like how, how recommendations become policy or how they're actually implemented. Sue made the, made the point that uh, in Ireland, they're essentially uh, the citizens assembly, especially when it's gone on to change the constitution in the case of uh, equal marriage and abortion, there was the assembly process that formed recommendation and then there was the legal referendum process. And so why the assembly process didn't have any binding power, the referendum process did. And the, the, the intuition here is that the combination of some assembly process can mitigate some of the, the the kind of more the more poisonous effects of referendums in our mass media society, in which basically you're setting up a, a yes or no binary question that can be kind of poisonous to the political to the political um, or or societal fabric because you're you're pitting people against each other and you're allowing more nuanced uh, opinions to come forward before that happens. Um, we've got two minutes, but I'm wondering if people are happy to stay on for maybe a few minutes. I can ask one more. Um, Jameson asks, what efforts are available to mitigate bias, which is introduced by politicians or ignorance generally? Yeah, this is kind of like the million dollar question uh, with, uh, with juries. Um, and, you know, um, uh, yeah, so I mean, I think one is just like a variety of view viewpoints in the room, like, you know, um, as Philip was talking, like uh, truly representative uh, groups, right, are hard to come by. And, um, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we hope that just in that, um, uh, the, the, the range of experiences, um, uh, you know, uh, bias won't take hold. Um, uh, but um, some of the more, you know, pointed things that are being done in courtrooms now um, uh, are um, talking about implicit bias uh, to uh, during the jury selection stage and then also before the jury goes to deliberate like what it is and the judge you know some judges say like even I suffer from it you know maybe you know uh, implicit bias and so there's nothing to be ashamed of and you know but, but it's, it's like through talking about it and and um, and being willing to listen to other people's under understandings can can we try to mitigate the, uh, the uh, those experiences um, but um, about in my own work I'm really uh, thinking about how to define impartiality more clearly such that um, uh, that it stops being this kind of lofty view from nowhere idea and more how do people in the real world who have you know opinions about um, about the law about prisons about um, racial discrimination how can they make impartial decisions so I think um, thinking about um, uh, decision making in the legal sphere as a very specific set of things that we go through is a way uh, that we think through is a way for all of us to check our, our biases um, uh, in, in that deliverable space. Phil, did you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, just briefly, I think like that, that's the driving question behind creating that kind of ideal learning environment. I would say it's 
literally inviting in folks who will force the assembly to confront and bring about the key core differences in opinion. And um, I think the beautiful thing about the assembly process is that um, because you're, you're deliberating on these larger issues, there's a way in which it will help us figure out how to build essentially better schools for democracy, a better, better, better ways of, of teaching, especially young people, uh, how to live in a democracy and how to, how to go about learning in, the, in, in democracy. So I think it's, it's uh, bringing in the contrary opinions and allowing that, modeling that in public, in a public sphere, um, in a healthy way with good facilitation.